morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this session. It's going to be really good. You don't have a better view than that, do you, of Westminster Abbey? Um, in that abbey, 3,000 people have been buried. Many of them have uh, met a sticky and violent end, so it's perhaps apt what we're talking about um, today. Edward the Confessor is buried there, the predecessor of King Harold, who famously died in the Battle of Hastings with an arrow through the eye. Um, so there you go. Perhaps you can pop in afterwards. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. We've got three incredible speakers. My name is Alex. I'm a commander with the Metropolitan Police uh, with a specialist crime remit. Uh, that remit covers armed robbery. Um, it covers human trafficking, child sexual exploitation, economic crime, cybercrime, the sort of specialist crimes. But we have three great people here too. And they are, firstly, Rosanna Ander, who is the executive director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and Education Lab, uh, she has spent her life fighting gun crime in the States. Thank you very much, Rosanna, for being here. She also grew up in a commune, if you wanted to ask her some questions about that afterwards. Uh, Evelyn Diaz is here as uh, president of the Heartland Alliance for Human Needs, a human rights organisation with a big budget that is really interested in high-impact interventions to reduce violence. Again, a history of working uh, in intervention, but strangely and quite as a quite a rare person I think someone who is really interested in causal impact I I certainly have had experience working with philanthropists and NGOs who were more interested in selecting data that makes their intervention look good uh, Evelyn is certainly not of that mold and she really wants to understand whether things are going right or not and then Sarah Heller who is a professor of economics from the University of Michigan uh, so an academic in specializing in the economics of crime uh, but also with a real keen interest in designing interventions that can be evaluated effectively. So you have three great people here today, and uh, I look forward to your questions to them. When I was uh, walking here this morning from Maida Vale, I, I walked through London. It was quite a nice three-and-a-half-mile walk past all the landmarks. I was uh, listening to an interview with a guy called David Baltimore, who's a virology professor, uh, who first analysed retroviruses um, and with some rare leukaemias and subsequently with AIDS um, and had an incredible impact. And he said something which I listened to this morning that I thought had incredible salience for today. He said, the worst thing that can happen is to not know what's causing a disease because that gives liberty to fantasy. Uh, and I think that's pretty relevant to today, really, when we talk about violent crime uh, and understanding what the causes of crime are. Um, and certainly I've been involved in evidence-based policing uh, for a long time, which really seeks to understand the causes of crime and what works as far as interventions are concerned. So when we talk about the causes of crime, uh, I'm going to show you some data from London and England and Wales in a bit. But the College of Policing has done some work uh, in the UK around what causes crime and what's effective from an intervention point of view. For knife crime, for example, we know that people carry knives for three reasons. Uh, they carry it for self-protection, particularly if they've been a victim of a violent crime previously. They carry it for self-presentation, for respect, for credibility. And they also carry it for utility, because they want to use it to cause harm, they want to use it to rob, they want to use it to intimidate. And when we look at the data, it is quite clear the... Most prevalent age for knife carrying uh, in England and Wales is 15 years old. And it is perhaps without coincidence that we've had two tragedies in the last week here in London where Perry Jordan Brammer and Michael Irvin, both 15-year-old both boys, uh, were stabbed to death. We have data around gender. We know that males are massively overrepresented uh, in the knife carrying and victim population, both for knives and guns. We know that exclusion has a huge effect as far as risk is concerned, concerning those people who are most likely to carry and most likely to be victims. And we know that uh, there's some good data on ethnicity, uh, and that ethnicity only accounts for a very small portion of those people carrying knives. So in actual fact, some of the cliches out there, certainly from the UK context, are wrong. And some of, from an England and Wales point of view, the idea that gangs are all responsible for knife and gun crime is, uh, is a fallacy as well. Uh, but it is more pertinent in London, in the capital, where being a member of a gang is a much higher risk factor. And when we move on, therefore, to interventions, we would therefore like to 
think that we have some strong evidence of what works. But if I can quote from the College of Policing Systematic Review, it says, strong conclusions about what works to reduce, not, to reduce knife crime uh, are difficult due to a lack of robust evaluations. Uh, and that's what we're here today to talk about, more robust evaluations, so that we, uh, in the UK context, can apply better interventions to reduce them. But what does work? What are the signs of success in this area? Well, firstly, multifaceted interventions, unsurprisingly, um, not just deterrence, but also working with mums, working with families, multi-systemic therapy, cognitive behavioural therapy, um, multi-agency interventions, as I've described, things like the pulling levers approach that worked pretty well over in the States where you offer strong support, uh, but also strict enforcement, and rapid communication with offenders. Why are you doing this? You know, uh, you're not done to, you're done with. And obviously, restorative justice also seems to have a big effect. So where are we then with knife crime? So these are knife crime offences in London. The top line is offences reported to the police. Now, offences can often be confusing because if we stop someone and we arrest you for possession of a knife, that's obviously a knife crime. Uh, so it's best to look at the bottom uh, indicator, which shows knife crime with injury offences. And that's actually shown a small reduction this year compared to last year um, of about 9%. Uh, again, not what you'd probably believe if you've read the media. And if we look at gun crime offences in London, um, here again you'll see the bottom line is perhaps the best indicator because that's uh, gun crime with lethal barrel discharges. And again, we actually see a small reduction uh, from the previous year. We have, though, just reached our 100th homicide victim in London this year, this week. If we compare it to England and Wales, it's not such a good picture, and we can see that uh, certainly knife offences are on the rise, including uh, knife offences with injury. And from a gun crime point of view, um, uh, we can see it's relatively stable. So gun offences with injury across England and Wales. And then, interestingly, and I'm sure there'll be some comparative analysis from our speakers, if we look at Chicago, because we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about... Um, Chicago. Let's look at gun homicide in Chicago versus the whole of England and Wales uh, and one city compared to two nations and you can see that it's quite a distinct difference and clearly there's a number of reasons for that. The gun culture here is very different to that in the US. I've just had the pleasure of being an Englishman in New York having visited uh, eastern states last week uh, and uh, I did find it a little strange. So the first thing was as a 43-year-old with my wife trying to buy a bottle of wine, she didn't have any identification, so I said, OK, I'll buy it. And they still refused to sell me wine because the, the cashier said, um, I know you're actually buying it for her, so your ID's not good enough. I said, but I'm going to drink it with her. And he said, so, sir, that's not good. So we couldn't buy wine. And then, and then we went to a swimming pool, uh, and I was with my five-year-old daughter, and she had armbands on because she's just learning to swim. And the lifeguard came over and said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to remove those armbands because they're not government-approved. Uh, and therefore they're not safe. And I said, but if I remove the armband, she's going to drown. Um, and uh, she said, yeah, but they have to have armbands with a bit of a body here because if she goes like this, sometimes they've fallen off and you, your child will die. And I said, but my child will die if I... Ta anyway, I, I, lost, I lost the arguments, had to take the armbands off, uh, and we had to leave the swimming pool. And I then went into a very famous supermarket, um, and it felt like it was an armoury. Uh, and this experience with buying wine and not being able to swim with armbands and then walking into a supermarket where I can buy a whole series of shotguns, pistols, ammunition. It was one of those things I thought, you know, we're, met, we're very close uh, and sometimes we're also very far apart. Um, so I'm really looking forward to what we're going to speak about today. And my first speaker is going to be Rosanna, who's going to introduce some of the information from Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. I think you stole most of my thunder. But, um, so I am going to spend a little bit of time saying some pretty critical and I think sobering things about Chicago, but I would be remiss if I didn't also say it is an amazing, beautiful, incredible city. This is just a photograph of the bean, uh, as we call it, in downtown Chicago. And I think part of the really um, heartbreaking thing about Chicago is it really is a tale of t at least two cities. We have a city that parts of it are as safe as many places here in Europe, and other places are as dangerous as the most dangerous places on the planet. Um, and so we spend a lot of our time focused on trying to 
address the parts of the city that are not as safe as the downtown area here. Um, so I want to give you a little bit more context. So Chicago is a city of about 3 million people. Um, our population's actually been decreasing, which is really kind of going against the trend of urbanization across the globe. Uh, we, uh, our population's decreased by about 200,000 over the last decade or so. Um, and we also have extreme wealth and extreme poverty. So this is just a map that shows uh, the in 1970, we really had sort of, you know, People, middle income, low income, and with wealth. The wealthy part is the blue part. The dark red is the very low income, just in case you can't see the slides here. Um, that was 1970. This is what 2017 looks like. Extreme poverty uh, and then extreme wealth. And those areas of the city with extreme poverty also very much overlap with the parts of the city that have very, very high rates of gun violence. Um, as a city, we are about a third white, a third Latino, and a third African American, but we are incredibly segregated as well as a city. So I just want to provide some of that um, background. We also are a city that is not flush with resources. Um, the, this is just uh, the Washington Post, which I, I don't think is a newspaper that is really uh, hyperbolic. Uh, this was a headline uh, about the pension crisis that we're facing. And so if you think about us as a city with a decreasing population, we have to still pay those pension uh, obligations, regardless of how many people are contributing to the tax base. So it's a real challenge if you look forward into the future, how we're going to uh, continue to meet those obligations with a shrinking population. And I would argue that the violence challenge that our city faces really is contributing to people moving out of the city. Because when you look at where people are leaving from, it's the highest poverty, highest violence neighborhoods. And so, um, you know, thinking about the violence problem, too often we think of it as uh, the people in those neighborhoods are the ones that are really bearing the burden. And that's certainly true that they pay the highest price for the violence, but it really, Chicago is the economic engine for the region. And even people who don't live in those neighborhoods should be thinking about why it is in their interest to really get our arms around the violence. So I want to talk a little bit about the organization that I helped to launch and the work that we're doing, which does uh, intersect with the, the point of this whole conference, which has been absolutely incredible. So thank you, Handen, and to, to your colleagues for putting it together. It's been a real privilege. Um, so I want to go back to 2007 in Chicago. These were some of the headlines uh, in our local newspaper. Um, in particular, the, the year of violence, uh, 27 students slain, this was the education reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and she was tracking the number of Chicago public school kids who were shot over the course of a year. What's really sad is this wasn't a new problem for our city, but framing it as school-aged kids as opposed to in dismissive terms like gang members shooting other gang members started to galvanize some real attention uh, among the civic uh, population, civic leaders, foundations, and others. Um, and on the heels of that series of news stories, the University of Chicago lost one of its own students. A doctoral student, a young man from Senegal, was shot and killed basically on campus uh, in a robbery uh, gone bad that turned into a homicide. And that got the university, in the context of this larger city conversation, to start to ask the question, what could we at the University of Chicago do to help our city address this uh, challenge of gun violence? Um, as many of you know, University of Chicago uh, brags about, um, and I think rightfully so, how many Nobel Prize winning economists and other Nobel laureates uh, have a connection to University of Chicago. And yet, those same Nobel laureates, as well as everybody else uh, on the faculty, would not walk two blocks to the south or two blocks to the west of the University of Chicago at night because of the violence problem. And so that really got some of the faculty at the University of Chicago to start to ask the question, if we have all of this incredible intellectual heft and we are a world-renowned research university, surely we can do something to help our home city uh, address this problem of gun violence. And what was absolutely true uh, then and now, and I'm sure is true uh, in, in all of the um, communities that, that you guys come from, is there is innovation already happening. There are people working in neighborhoods, in communities, close to the challenges that have very creative ideas for what to do about the gun violence or the violence uh, challenges. Um, so the best ideas are not going to come out of the academy, but what the academy can contribute is 
being able to partner with those frontline practitioners and policymakers when those interventions are being implemented to generate really, really rigorous uh, information about what impact those efforts are having. And so that was sort of the core idea behind the crime lab. So what we uh, are doing is partnering with frontline practitioners and policymakers to identify things that are promising, very rigorously testing them. I think there's this sort of um, false notion that things can either be really rigorous, but not particularly relevant or useful to the real world, or they can be super useful, but not very rigorous. And what we're trying to say is we can do causal inference, really rigorous evaluations, but in ways that are immediately actionable and useful to frontline practitioners and policymakers. So that's what we try to do is test those ideas. And when we find things that are really working, partner with the public sector to try to bring them to much larger scale so that the public dollars can uh, have much more impact. Um, and so I want to say a couple more things about Chicago, and then I'm going to let my colleagues go uh, deeper on a couple of specific uh, programs that we've been involved in that really draw on incredible and useful insights from behavioral economics. One important piece of context. So in our home city of Chicago, uh, we have four people who work in the mayor's office to help manage the city's entire strategy around violence and public safety. So that is policing, fire, Office of Emergency Management, so the 911, uh, and all the social programs that are uh, focused on, on violence. In the city of New York, there are 100 people. Um, and so it really is a challenge, and I think one of the reasons why we've been working so closely with the city is to try to fill in some of that capacity uh, that the city internally does not have. Um, We've been able to work with lots of, these are just uh, logos from some of the different public sector agencies that we partner with. Um, and, and then here are some of the nonprofits that we work with uh, in Chicago, just to give you an example. Um, so I want to say just a couple of more quick things to give you a little bit more context of the um, work going on in Chicago. So this is the homicide rate going back to 1985. Um, we started in 2007, and uh, those were the quote-unquote good old days uh, when we look at what happened. So in 2016, our city of Chicago, our city of 3 million people, had a nearly 60% increase in homicides and shootings. Uh, it was a sudden increase, and it was sustained throughout the course of uh, 26, the whole year, 2016. Every month was higher than the month the year before. Um, and we can go in, hopefully, during the conversation about what might have driven that. Um, but I want to show you Chicago compared to other cities as well. So this is the top five uh, cities population-wise in the United States. So New York City is uh, blue on the bottom, and then Chicago is the, the red line at the top. Uh, Philadelphia, Houston, and Los Angeles. What's really <laughs> remarkable is... You look back to the early uh, to mid-1980s, Chicago, New York, all, all of these cities went up around the same time and went down around the same time. Uh, New York and Los Angeles in particular are noteworthy because while we started in very similar places, they've continued to drive their homicides down significantly pretty much year after year. Chicago in the mid-2000s uh, sort of leveled off, and then we had that hockey stick uh, crisis. Um, this I is might, might just be worth stressing. That's yeah. great per hundred thousand. Yes, per hundred thousand. So it's apples to apples comparison. Yep. Um, and this is just adding in a few other U.S. cities. And why I think this is important is Chicago. Now, when it's added in with a bunch of other cities, we're sort of in the middle of the pack for U.S. cities, and it, it is all relative. Um, so hopefully, what we're learning about what works for whom and why will not only benefit Chicago, but many other cities that frankly have much higher rates, much bigger challenges with homicide and violence. And so we are really trying to be very intentional in the work that we do so that we're generating information, not just for our home city, but for uh, the field more broadly and for other cities like Chicago. Um, the good news is, and I hope we do get to talk about this in the question and answer, 2016 went up. It was I would argue not by accident that we saw things start to come back down. Something about the violence in Chicago that is probably true in other places, but I don't know other places as well, the more violence you have, the more violence you have, 
incidents lead to retaliations, which lead to retaliations. And so uh, it was very, very likely that the numbers would continue to go up absent some type of intervention or approach that really was trying to deliberately turn the, turn the corner. And there were some very concrete things that did happen that I'm happy to talk about in the question and answer. Um, so I do want to just put Chicago in the context of other cities, not just in the US. Uh, again, Chicago, uh, really, compared to Los Angeles and New York and places like London, uh, are struggling mightily. But again, what we learn in Chicago has the potential to have implications for places even you know, outside of the US context that also have very high rates of gun violence um, or, or violence more generally. So I'm gonna let my wonderful colleague, uh, Sarah Heller, talk a little bit about some of the, the work that we've been doing and, and then Evelyn's gonna finish up with uh, some of the lessons learned in doing this work that hopefully will be relevant not just to those of us in Chicago. So thank you. Uh, so I am an academic, it's my confession to start with. Um, so my main task today is to tell you about two of the studies uh, that I've been involved in to address the challenges that Rosanna just talked about. Um, but I want to start first by talking a little bit about the process through which we came to these studies. And I'm doing that in part um, because uh, there are people in the audience from all over the world. The programs that have actually worked in Chicago may or may not be relevant to your context. But I think the process uh, is pretty transferable across settings. And part of what I think has been so successful is that they've been genuine partnerships between researchers and policymakers and practitioners. And I think about that process in, in sort of these three parts. So we start not just by throwing money at the problem, uh, but by really trying to understand the context that is driving uh, the problem that we're looking at. And so we bring all the data we have to bear to really try to understand where and among whom the problem is concentrated and then use that information to decide who should be the target of interventions and how to reach them. Because when we're talking about something like violence, uh, the people who might need the intervention are probably not the ones knocking down your door begging for pro-social activities. Um, so having decided who to target, we then think seriously about hypothesizing what really is driving the behavior and what innovations might change it. So that involves delving into the literature, understanding what's worked in the past and what hasn't, and thinking about what theory might sort of push uh, new directions to test. And then because there is a very long history of well-intentioned interventions that don't actually work, we rigorously test them, like Rosanna mentioned. So everything, all of the projects we're talking to you about today, we've set up as randomized control trials. So that's like a clinical trial in medicine where uh, people are randomly assigned to either a treatment group or a control group, which means at the end of the day, we can compare outcomes for those two groups and be really sure that any differences between them are because of the program itself, because that's the only difference other than a coin flip between the two groups. So everything is set up that way. Um, okay, so let me start telling you about the first program, which is called Becoming a Man, or BAM. Um, and for uh, transparency, this is not my program or, or our program. This is run by and developed and implemented by a nonprofit called Youth Guidance. Uh, and Tony DiVittorio, who's on the left over there, uh, developed the, the program itself. So to sort of walk through our process, we first thought about who to target. So as Rosanna mentioned... Uh, back in 2007, when we were starting to plan this, the focus was really on violence among high school students. And so we started thinking about the sort of high school population. We focused on boys because they're disproportionately involved in violence. Uh, and we chose a, a set of schools who were, that were sort of in high violence neighborhoods. But we didn't just sort of say, let's blanket the school. We tried to use the, all of the administrative data we had access to to find the right margin of people who are at risk, high enough risk to be at risk of violence. So we ended up defining that after some work with the data, certain number of course failures, certain number of absences, but not so far disconnected that they wouldn't benefit from a program that was actually happening in school. Right? So it was sort of that key margin that we thought would uh, be potentially responsive. And then we thought about, all right, so for this population, what behavior do we really want to target? And BAM has a lot of different pieces. The piece that we think is sort of the most relevant is centered around something that will be familiar to a behavioral audience, uh, automatic decision making. So this idea that a bunch of our behaviors are driven uh, by processes of which we're not fully aware. So if something happens, you have an automatic thought that you're not aware of, and that drives a behavior because our brains just sort of apply whatever scripts we've learned in our past to these new situations. 
So you could imagine that a youth who has sort of over a lot of exposure uh, to disadvantaged, unstable, potentially dangerous situations growing up has learned that a defensive, a little bit aggressive reaction is actually quite adaptive, right? Because that's what keeps you from being victimized when you're out in your neighborhoods is to be defensive and a little bit aggressive automatically. But if you deploy that script in the wrong situation, in front of a teacher who's telling you to sit down and be quiet, or in front of a peer who's carrying a gun, it can have a much more negative consequence. And so that's sort of the idea of what BAM is based on around the sort of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT process of getting kids to recognize that that automatic decision-making process in themselves. So figure out what their automatic thoughts are, recognize when they're having them, and slow down and make slightly more considered decisions in those sort of hot moments that might otherwise lead to behaviors that could lead to school dropout or to violence. So that's a sort of very high-level uh, description of BAM. Um, and so we evaluated it. We ran an RCT with uh, over 2,000 students, and we tracked those students in administrative data sources from the Chicago Police and Chicago Public Schools. And uh, using administrative data is a great way to help keep your costs down if you're thinking about doing RCTs so you don't have to go out and collect the, the data yourself. So what did we find? We found a 45% decline in violent crime arrests in that first year of the program. So that's a huge success. That's a very large uh, decline in violence. The decline in violence was focused mostly on the year of the program itself. It didn't last past that. But what did last past that is an increase in school engagement that actually ended up translating when we followed up years later into between a 12 and 19% increase in graduation rates, uh, high school graduation. So if you would try to sort of assign the social cost of crime and the social benefits of increased education and, and do the math, we figured out that the benefits of the program are somewhere between five and 30 times as much as the cost. So this looks like a very cost-effective program. Uh, so this is super exciting, success, uh, but it is not a panacea, right? So one, these programs tend to be hard to scale, and so we're not reaching everyone with BAM. And two, even among the treatment group, even though there is this big improvement in, in outcomes, there's still dropout, there's still violence. So this is not sort of problem solved and walk away. We're still thinking about the problem. So in the second, uh, lead up to the second study, we were talking with the city about how do we reach more youth, uh, especially during the summer. So the summer is a very high violence time. Uh, kids are not in school. Uh, the weather is hot. All of these things sort of increase violence. Uh, and the city spends a lot of money on delivering various versions of summer jobs programs. So they you know, pay kids to, to do jobs over the summer. Um, and in talking to the city, they asked us, does this sort of one summer Chicago program, which is a big umbrella for all the different sorts of summer jobs programs going on, does it do the things we're wanting it to do? Is it actually decreasing violence as well as per potentially improving education and employment outcomes? So there's lots of reasons to think that a summer jobs program might do those things. So it's providing money. Uh, it's teaching kids about the value of education in the labor market. Uh, it's developing connections with employer networks, developing skills, and just keeping kids busy, right? If you're physically on the job, you can't also be physically standing on the quarter getting yourself into trouble. Uh, but at the time, there was really no rigorous evidence about whether these programs actually did any of these things. Despite the fact that they had been going on for decades in almost every American city, we really didn't know very much about whether the spending was, was doing something productive. So we decided to test it. And again, working through our process, we thought, well, who are we going to target? If we're going to sort of have this summer jobs program piece of it that we're going to evaluate, who are we going to evaluate that for? So we focused again on a sort of school-based recruiting strategy. Uh, and so picked uh, 13 schools with high levels of violence. But here we really did open up the application to everyone and said, if you're in this school, uh, we're going to let you apply. And there was no guarantee that this was the right thing to do because in Chicago, geography doesn't necessarily assign school. Parents can choose where to send their kids. So just because we were sort of targeting some of these schools didn't mean we were going to get the right population. You can see where we ended up. So this is a map of Chicago. The darker the red, the more violent crime, the higher violent crime rate is. And each green dot is an applicant to the program. And so you can see that after some sort of real work thinking about how to target, we did a pretty good job in getting kids to apply who were living in the highest crime neighborhoods in Chicago. And in fact, once we got the data on everybody, we saw that the, uh, about 20% of the sample had been arrested prior to the start of the program. Um, so we successfully found people who were sort of starting to get involved in crime. 
so we set it up as an RCT. Uh, we ran our lottery. We delivered the program. Um, and we had to sort of figure out what is that program going to look like. So it was an eight-week program at the time, five hours a day, uh, five days a week. But I knew sort of through my work through the research that there were a lot of efforts to deliver short-term jobs programs to reentry populations, to youth populations, and they didn't seem to do a whole lot. So we didn't want to just sort of stop and say, let's try this thing that has been tried before. So we added some pieces. We added in part an adult job mentor at a ratio of about 10 youth to one mentor, whose job it was basically to help the youth deal with their barriers to employment. So whether that was getting identification you needed to work, dealing with transportation challenges, or helping to sort of negotiate through conflicts with supervisors, the adult mentor was someone whose responsibility it was to make sure that this program was a success for you. Uh, on top of that, for half of the youth, a randomly selected half, we replaced two hours of work a day with a CBT program, uh, so a CBT-based curriculum. So we had seen some of the early results for BAM, and we wanted to build on them, thinking maybe part of the reason that jobs programs have not been successful for youth in the past is that they, uh, they don't quite have the soft skills to benefit, right? They need some of that self-regulation first in order to learn what they should be learning on the job. And so we decided to test that by adding this CBT curriculum. So overall, uh, this is what we found. So this is violent crime arrests per 100 youth. Uh, and we found a 42% decline in violent crime arrests uh, in the first year after the program. And that's not just during the summer when the program was delivered. It was also after. So students are learning something that they're taking with them that decreases uh, the amount of violence they're engaging in after the program is over. And there was no sort of detectable difference between the CBT group and the non-CBT group. So that tells us something important that is not just the CBT that's driving this decline. So this is not the same effect that we saw in BAM because you don't actually need the CBT to create it. Now, it could be that the adult job mentor is teaching a bunch of those same lessons through engaging with the kids and conflict management that they learn in CBT anyway. That could still be an important mechanism, but it wasn't necessary to create the crime decline itself. Um, so this is exciting as well, but you can see this is after a year, and it took us a little bit of time as well to get the data and analyze it. And it turns out that policy works on a timetable that is, uh, doesn't quite match up with the length of time it takes to do an academic study. We're slow, right? And so we got, we sort of implemented this in the summer of 2012 the first time. But then it became sort of the winter of that year. And Evelyn, who was running the department that ran this program at the time, said, well, we have to make decisions about next summer. We just did this RCT. What should we do? And so for an academic, this is terrifying because nothing is statistically significant again, uh, yet like not enough time has gone by. But we did see some of these tiny hints of the violence reduction, right? It wasn't quite significant yet, but we saw it there. So we told her that. And she said, great. If there's any chance that this program is, is working to reduce violence, I want to try it on the kids who are at the higher risk of violence than the ones who are still engaged in school, who are recruiting through the school pathways. I want to try that on the more disconnected youth. And so we changed the eligibility criteria the following year. So part of the youth were recruited in the same way, but part were recruited directly from the criminal justice system. So kids coming out of youth detention, uh, adult and juvenile probation, and so forth, who were more of the sort of out-of-school, out-of-work youth. And I told her at the time, I said, I have to be honest, I don't think the program is going to work for these kids. There's been lots of efforts for these kinds of population where short-term jobs programs really don't sort of do much, but it's an empirical question, so let's find out. I was totally wrong. So this is, these are the results I showed you before. Uh, this is the next cohort that included all of those more disconnected youth. And you can see the control group bar, which is the gray one. We succeeded in getting kids who are much more criminally active, right? So their baseline number of arrests were more than twice the prior year. But we still saw this 33% decline in violent crime arrests in that first year. So this is an important lesson that was against my sort of prior hypothesis, right? That this is reducing violence for everybody. Now, it's not reducing other types of crime. And in fact, when you go two to three years out, it seems like maybe property crimes could be going up a little bit, actually, among the treatment group, while the violence is, uh, has still declined. We also found no changes in education outcomes or in employment outcomes on average, which is a little bit of a surprise because some people sort of look at these early employment programs and say, we know early work experience matters. It should really be a sort of setting you off on a better employment trajectory. It doesn't seem to be doing that on average. 
But we pushed the data a little bit farther and used some new machine learning algorithms to look for treatment heterogeneity to search for subgroups who might have benefited. And what we found there is that there actually was a subgroup uh, whose improvement was improving over the next two to three years. And when we looked at who those were, the employment benefiters, they were the youth in the sample who were a little bit younger and a little bit more attached to school. So still going to school at a higher rate, doing a little bit better in school as well. Which by itself is a super interesting finding because if you think about who employment programs generally try to target, so employment pro uh, programs for youth, it's kids who are out of school and out of work who have been struggling with unemployment who those employment programs tend to target. And what we're finding here is that those aren't the kids who are benefiting, which is potentially a reason why some of those employment programs, at least in the US, don't work as well is because they might be targeting the wrong population. So we developed sort of some new hypotheses to, uh, to move forward with in terms of the employment side of the program. So to wrap up, I want to sort of uh, step back a second and say, so we found all of these things. What happened? Like, was this a useful exercise? So a bunch of stuff happened. So one is that Magic Johnson, who if you don't know is a super famous basketball player uh, from the US, gave $10 million to the program. And this happened in part because we had evidence where we could say, this is actually the effect of the program. It actually works to reduce violence in a very rigorous way. And so he donated money that uh, let the city scale up the program. And so that meant, uh, you can see at the bottom, that we can then test some of the issues that, that come with scaling. So we're continuing to evaluate this program as it scales up. It also happened that once we published the research results, there were a whole bunch of headlines about Chicago reducing violence. So I don't know if you can imagine seeing the word Chicago and violence in a headline in a positive article rather than a negative one. But this also brought a bunch of positive attention to the city and its efforts to sort of address this problem um, and you know, let us sort of continue our research and thinking about, so we're, we have a bunch of ongoing research now trying to not just test the scale up, but also the different variants and figuring out really what's going on, which pieces of the program are necessary, what's driving these effects. Um, so those are the studies very briefly uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Evelyn to t talk a little bit about um, her view on what makes these partnerships successful and a pro uh, study that we have ongoing now. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for having us. It has been my privilege and my uh, incredibly good fortune to work with the two brilliant women that you just heard from. First, from 2011 to 2015, when, as you heard, I was a policymaker at the time leading a city agency that was responsible for administering about $330 million annually for social programs in Chicago, everything from early childhood programs to aging programs and, and of course, as you heard, youth programs. And it was a job in which I was accountable to the mayor and to the public at large. And then since then, um, as a practitioner or service provider where I'm responsible for delivering high-impact social uh, programs to some of the most marginalized populations in society. Um, I do that through a large nonprofit NGO called Heartland Alliance, and I am now accountable to a board of directors <laughs> and scores of public and private fu um, funders. So in both roles, I'm working, uh, work, working with university researchers <laughs> to subject our programs to interventions has not, um, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for the researchers either, but um, I keep returning to this partnership. And so I'd like to take um, my time to really um, explain why I keep returning. I'm a firm believer that there are better and worse ways for researchers to work with policymakers and practitioners. And the, the researchers um, at the Urban Labs, um, uh, uh, Rosanna's team, are doing it well, and they're doing it well repeatedly. So I want to share some um, thoughts with you first about why I think they do it well repeatedly. Um, and then I'm going to highlight how this partnership has led to what I believe to be one of the most exciting and potentially consequential anti-gun violence programs happening in the United States today. So first, I'm going to start with um, what the Urban Labs gets right. And not on this slide, but I think important to note is that over the past 10 years, since, uh, since Rosanna founded the Crime Lab, they have created a demand for evidence by seizing on 
moments and um, and and seeking out really willing partners. So they've they're incredibly adept at identifying critical moments in time. So the spike in gun violence is one of those moments um, when key actors are going to be particularly receptive to wanting answers, to wanting to learn um, using evidence. And so um, government transitions, critical policy junctures are times um, like this. And that's when they got me. So um, Rosanna came to me uh, at a time when we were having a transition. We had a new mayor, Rahm Emanuel. He was uh, replacing a mayor who had been in office for 24 years. Um, and so it was this a moment to, to have a big pivot in city government. Um, I was a new appointee of the mayors. And our administration was really eager to make a break from the past. And that's when Rosanna showed up. Um, and she, she saw an opportunity for Chicago to address its violence problem in a new way and to use rigorous evaluation to learn from it. But the first time that I said yes to Rosanna, I did so really for three reasons. First of all, the University of Chicago um, was named credibility. She was coming to me with this credibility from a top-ranked um, world-class university. They had access to large administrative data sets that I would never have been able to access, school records, victimization data, arrest data, uh, labor market information, that would allow them to answer questions about my program participants' outcomes over time. And finally, they came to us offering their services for free and for a cash-strapped university that cost would have been a barrier that would have made it impossible for us to work with researchers. So that, that kind of walking in the door at critical moments, seizing on, finding curious um, uh, uh, leaders who are eager for change, and then bringing value right into the door at the right time has, was really important. The other thing that they do, and I, I think is maybe understated, um, is that most policymakers, even if we're curious about what's working and what's not working, we don't often know how to structure the questions the right way. And so early consultation with the researchers helped me understand what was possible to know from my programs and from the data that was available to us. Um, but they also helped then shape um, the questions that we could we could begin to answer in ways that I think were really incredibly compelling and relevant for um, my department. The next thing is that they partner um, they partner really effectively on design and on managing change during implementation. So early in the the, the program design process, there's a lot of back and forth where we're really trying to find a balance between how we can execute the program practically and efficiently on the ground and how each change that we make in that implementation plan is going to impact the, what the evaluation can tell us. And this back and forth has to be really timely. It has to be clear. It has to be done without ego on the part of the researcher um, and in a true spirit of partnership. And I think they've done particularly well in that regard. The, the other thing is that people, in case you haven't um, experienced this, people have lots of thoughts and feelings about randomization. And, um, and it's tricky to, to introduce the idea of randomization um, well, uh, doing it in a way where the people who are involved feel comfortable with how it's conducted and feel that it's ethical uh, and communicated is a bit of an art. And in our partnerships, the researchers have been incredibly sensitive to these concerns and responsive to them. Um, for me, they were also important um, as somebody who cares a lot about um, uh, high quality execution on, on program interventions, they were these objective eyes on our real time execution. So they would provide immediate feedback to my program supervisors and program leads and to me about any inconsistencies, errors, challenges that they were seeing on the ground that could affect the outcome of the study. Um, importantly, at City Hall, we operated, and you heard uh, Rosanna talking about this a little bit, 
we operated at a breakneck pace. There were two times per year where I needed to make key decisions. One was when I was establishing my budget for the year, and then six months later when I was bidding out the work. Um, we, in addition to that, we often implemented programs at a grand scale about three months after we awarded uh, contracts. So the, the pace at which we're working uh, was really fast, and our research partners needed to understand that about our work, be able to operate on our timeline, gathering and presenting data, uh, turning around analyses, meeting on a dime, making swift decisions. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that really sets apart the researchers at the university, uh, at the urban labs. And then finally, this is really important. You um, heard Sarah talking about Magic Johnson and the publicity that that got us. Um, and I mentioned earlier that as a public official, I, have an account, I had an account, accountability to the public and to the mayor. Now as a practitioner to a board of directors and to funders, and all of these groups want to know what impact their investments are making or having on the social inc uh, outcomes that we are all trying to affect. And um, having those results communicated by a respected research organization has translated very reliably into new re resources for, um, for program expansion and significant resources for new program interventions. And so that brings us then to the work that we are doing now together um, since I left city government. So I left in um, mid-2015. I left government to take on my dream job, which is leading this global human rights organization called Heartland Alliance. And soon after I left, our city found itself once again at this critical moment. 762 homicides, the highest we had experienced in two decades. When the crime labs and, uh, analysts reviewed the year's shootings and homicides, the age distribution of the shooting victims really caught our attention. And this was because we both knew, the researchers and I knew, that the city government, um, one moment, we knew that city government and private and corporate philanthropies were investing heavily at that time in high school aged youth. So easily they were spending over $100 million annually on violence prevention programs for that age group. And very little was being spent on violence interventions targeting the 18 and over population, which actually represented 87% of the shooting victims that horrible year 2016. So with this information, along with results from the previous RCTs on programs for youth like BAM and on the Summer Jobs Program, Rosanna came to me, now in my new role, and asked if I wanted to design a new intervention. Using predictive analytics, she told me, um, as well as street-level intelligence, I told her, we, <laughs> we would design a program that was precision targeted at these individuals, the people who are most acutely at risk of being involved in gun violence in four of the most violent community areas in Chicago, and we would rigorously evaluate its impact through an RCT. It sounded bold, it sounded risky, uh, it sounded like something we could do at a significant scale, so I was in. Um, and there's a lot that I can share about the process we went through to design the, the, the project. It's the, the program is called Ready Chicago, uh, Ready standing for Rapid Employment and Development Initiative. Um, there's lots I can share about the process we went through, how we raised the money for it, um, the ultimate structure we ended up with, and all of our partners. But for now, I just want to offer that we worked with about a dozen community-based organizations to determine how we were going to find the individuals who were at the very highest risk of gun violence involvement. And we ultimately identified three referral pathways, one being um, a list of individuals generated by the crime, crime lab's predictive assessment of risk, street-level intelligence, so lists generated by street outreach workers who are 
tuned into more immediate um, gang conflicts and dynamics. Uh, and our corrections institutions who refer individuals who are soon going to be released from incarceration uh, and returning to their home communities and who they feel are at a uh, very high risk of being involved in violence upon their release. Then once we knew kind of who we were going to be targeting, um, we designed an approach that we believed would work for that group of people, um, given what we had learned from other studies, given their realities. Um, there are four main ingredients to the, the program design. The first is that we rely very heavily on street outreach workers. We knew recruiting of individuals who, who um, are difficult to find and don't um, choose to be in programs. Uh, we knew that recruiting them was going to be really hard, so we hire people with lived experience, people from the community who are credible and who have an ability to build uh, immediate trust and rapport with the very same men we are trying to recruit into the program. And those outreach workers practice what we call relentless engagement, which means we understand that when they knock at the door of somebody who is at very high risk and say we have a program offering for you, um, that they're going to get a no. They're going to get a no often, um, and that they're prepared for that, and they're prepared to stand with a posture that we are not going to give up on you. We're just going to keep calling you every single day. We're not going to give up on you. And they do that for up to 12 months. Um, the model also includes 18 months of paid work. We knew jobs uh, were not going to be enough based on the prior evidence, but we knew that a paying job could help the guys show up every day. And it was also important for us to include jobs because members of the communities themselves have been repeatedly saying that jobs are going to be the thing that stops the violence. So it was an important ingredient for us to include. Next, we, um, based on evidence from our prior RCTs, including the BAM program that you heard about, we added cognitive behavioral therapy to the model. That includes um, hours of group sessions like like BAM circles, but also um, embedding CBT principles and methods throughout the program. And then finally, we knew that we would be working with men whose lives are complicated and have many barriers to employment. So we added support services, coaches, uh, help with substance use, housing, legal services, uh, for example. So that is the model in a nutshell. We launched the program two years ago. Uh, we will continue running it for another two years. We are measuring the effectiveness uh, of the program on reducing shootings and homicides uh, through the RCT. Over 2,000 men and counting have been ra randomized into the study. And along the way, we are trying to learn as much as we can about the participants themselves, their families, their stories, their challenges, the, their circumstances, their triumphs. And we look forward uh, to keeping the field apprised of what we're learning over time. Um, I am at time, so I'm going to stop there, but we'll be happy to share more detail during the Q&A. And certainly, uh, you can uh, reach out always uh, through email for more information about the program and the partnership. Thank you. And back to you, Commander. Well, thanks. That was super interesting, really. And if all the questions coming through on Slido are a predictor of interest from the audience, then uh, it's brilliant. I, I've tried to get some of the questions and put them all together in the sort of categories that make sense. Um, and the first one, then, is around quite a few questions around evaluation. Um, uh, sparked by using arrest rates. People interested, have you considered using other stuff than arrest rates? Obviously, use graduation, I, I noticed. I was interested in harm. So, uh, uh, and have you used proxies for harm as well? And would you do that? Um, and other people were sparked the interest around the, the perceived displacement into acquisitive crime as well. So I think that one probably comes to Rosanna and Sarah uh, to say. We love data. We will use every scrap of data we can get our hands on. So we don't just use the arrest data. We do use the schooling uh, and not just... Um, primary school, secondary, but also post-secondary outcomes. Um, we also look at victimization, health data. So we are trying to extract as much signal out of all the data that we can get our hands on. Sometimes we're limited in what we're able to get, but we do think it's important to be looking at a, a broad range of, of different outcomes. 
Um, and then there was a displacement question. I don't yeah, know what so inquisitive have, have crime you, is. I think oh. you, you just dropped in a little bit of interest where you said, oh, it looks yeah, like in year me. three they, they <laughs> seem to commit more inquisitive crime and a lot oh. of people sparked on that yep, and thought, that. oh, yeah, let's expand yep. that a bit. Sure. <laughs> um, so, I mean, just to, to build off what Rosanna said, so crime is hard to measure. This is a hard thing to do, right? So there is this underlying behavior that no one, well, no one person observes. So we use arrest partly because it's something that we can observe in the data, and there's pretty good evidence that it's at least correlated, although not perfectly correlated, with the actual underlying behavior. Um, victimization records are, like Rosanna said, we use them too. So the victimization records we get from the police are also not perfect because it confounds actual victimization with a willingness to report to the police. And so if that's going up, is it because trust in institutions are going up, so more people are reporting, or because victimization is actually going up. So we also work to get the health records. So we try to sort of build the whole picture, but it is absolutely true that relying just on arrest records would not be a super optimal thing to do, I think. Um, in terms of the acquisitive crime, so this is actually, interestingly, I think something that has come up in multiple studies, not just ours. So if you look at like the Moving to Opportunity project, which sort of gave people housing vouchers to move to lower poverty neighborhoods, they found a similar thing where violence went down and property crimes went up. And so I think the, the way that I rationalize that, because I'm an economist who thinks about the economics of crime, is that if you're putting people in new situations uh, where maybe they're going to new neighborhoods, they're uh, working at employers, there's more stuff around to steal. And so if you increase the opportunity for crime, you might also increase that that sort of... Uh, acquisitive crime as well. That's consistent with the moving to opportunity story. If where people move to richer neighborhoods, there's more stuff to steal there. If we're looking at it from a social cost perspective, violent crime is so much more socially costly than property crime that I think if you ask any policymaker, what is the trade-off that you would prefer? They would much rather have less violence and, and more property crime. So from a social cost perspective, I think it's still a win. Um, my guess about what's going on is that it's sort of about changing opportunities and changing time use. Okay, thanks very much. There were quite a lot of questions that came in in relation to the content of the experiment. So uh, I think some people might have listened to that Freakonomics episode, which is when doing good hurts, where you saw a big backfire effect from mentoring. So there was questions on mentoring. Uh, what, what, was, what did the mentors do? Um, what was the background of the mentors? Um, could you uh, isolate the effect of mentoring against work and its relationship with the CBT? So I don't know, uh, Evelyn or... Sarah, can you expand on that? Sure. So, I mean, I, both of the programs I talked about have some mentoring component. Um, so I think in the, in the BAM case, there is a manualized curriculum. And so I think it's not just a, I'm a mentor, I'm going to give you advice. There is a set of tasks that they go through and activities to teach them to think about their own thinking. So you can also listen to my free economics podcast as a little advertisement to hear more about that. I'm not going to take the time to talk in depth, but I think part of... The power of that mentoring is that it is about a specific thing. It is teaching cognitive behavioral therapy skills. Um, and so that might be sort of a reason that it has different effects than other mentoring processes. I just want to mention that we also didn't talk about another study that we've done with a population that is even more sort of at risk and disconnected from institutions that combined mentoring and cognitive behavioral therapy. It's called Choose to Change. And it's... Um, a, a, we saw very similar impacts in terms of, of reductions in violent crime arrests. We saw spillover impacts on uh, siblings in the same household. Um, and so I think there really is something to combining the CBT as a sort of active ingredient or core element um, with credible messengers. And, and that, the Choose to Change program really did rely on mentors. I would think of them almost as super mentors because um, they were so relentless in their engagement with the young people, but they were also credible messengers in terms of having similar lived experiences, being able to really build a relationship with the young people. Um, so we're happy to share information on that, that study as well. And in terms of the job versus mentor, we were interested in that question too. So actually in 2015, we designed two treatment arms, one of which had mentoring and one of which didn't to try to separate out the job from the mentor. Uh, so you have to stay tuned for, for those results. It's not totally clear to us uh, in the field, whether the people who were assigned not to have a mentor actually didn't get any mentoring, because that's a hard thing to ask an organization to do, mentor these kids and don't mentor these kids. Um, so I'm not sure we'll have an answer at the end of the day, but uh, we're trying to figure that out. Okay, thanks. So it leads on to the next set of questions, really, which was around 
sort of political and other ethical kickbacks. And with your experience, Evelyn, in this field, I'd be interested uh, whether you met resistance to randomization, particularly for young people, whether you met resistance to predictive analytics. Um, and if you did, what, what do you do to overcome that? So, uh, so really, the choice uh, when, when I was a policymaker, the choice to engage in, in uh, a randomized control trial was my choice to make. And so, in this, so yes, people had feelings about it. People voiced um, their concerns about it, and I was still able to go ahead and um, and, and do it. The I, I think you're right. This is. Um, I think we still struggle with this, despite the fact that the crime lab has done such a great job of creating this demand, um, and, and people are more comfortable in Chicago with doing RCTs on social programs um, more than they ever have been. Um, there are still a group of uh, very vocal people who um, who are outspoken about their disdain for them. Um, they speak about... Um, doing research on people of color, um, so they so they head in that direction. They talk about um, uh, being unwilling to uh, randomize because they think that it's you know choosing winners and losers. Um, and so there's just a lot of misinformation. We I think we're we're trying to do more and more of a good job of explaining why randomization is a more fair process when you have um, a, you know scarcity that uh, a fairer way to distribute um, resources. We try to explain um, the methodology to to ensure that people understand we're not. Um, that we're, that we're being ethical in the way we, we do randomization. One thing that was really important for the Ready Chicago program is um, we were going to be offering, you know, a two-year job and cognitive behavioral therapy program to people. Um, in the community, it was really felt like, um, well, how are you going to give that to some guys and then not, not to other guys? They were just very, they were very concerned about this. And, um, and, you know, the way we talked about it with them was that the randomization was actually going to occur before anybody even knew the program, right? So you randomize a list of names, um, and then for those that end up in the treatment group, then you make the offer to those individuals. In other words, there isn't going to be a sell to everybody and then, oh, sorry, you want, you didn't win the lottery, and you did. Um, and so that that was more palatable to, co to the community groups. Um, they also insisted that uh, it was important that they also be able to um, use w their street level intelligence um, to make recommendations about who could uh, to, uh, to refer into the um, uh, into the, el uh, the the eligible pool. So, um, I, you know, as I said before, the the crime lab researchers they work with the community to address their concerns to. Um, find a way to move forward where, where people's concerns are addressed, and that has been really effective. Thank you. So I've had a question addressed to me around what can London learn from this, um, and, and I, think, I think there's a lot. I know MOPAC works really hard to try and be evidence-based about the interventions that the mayor is procuring. I think from a policing point of view, certainly the Met is moving in a direction of wanting to be increasingly evidence-based, and we're not shy of using randomised controlled trials. Uh, I think we can do more for that. I think we can be more joined up with crime labs. So there's, we're not short of universities, fortunately, here, and, and UCL is a big crime lab. But I, I think there's a lot more to coordinate. Uh, and when we're interested around the police impact on violence, you know, we wouldn't have police officers going in and, and being mentors, but we can certainly influence the procurement of that. But all our police activities should be subject to a level of scrutiny, particularly driven by austerity. And that, I know that's something the commissioner here uh, and others is, is really keen to achieve. Right, we have two really other interesting questions, which I'll ask all of you. Um, the first one is, what are you excited about that's coming down the line that you think, yes, I really want to try all that? So that's one. And quite a few people have said, why are girls non-violent? <laughs> and what about the girls? I mean, we're not all yeah. girls, obviously, non-violent, but there's a clear gender disparity here. So, there, so, so there's two questions there. Perhaps each of you have a go at those. 
Can I just say something about the London thing, though, too, which is, um, and this may sound strange coming from me, but I, I think people think everything has to be evidence-based, as in you have to take a program that's already been tested and just implement it. I think what is really exciting, um, maybe to pivot to, to that, is this idea of incredible innovation happening all over the place where cities learn from each other. And so it's not that London should take the programs that Chicago has implemented, but as you're rolling out new strategies and being creative and innovative, Innovating, doing it in a way that you guys can learn, but also we can learn from it. So I think that is really exciting because I, I do see how much cities l learn, you know, peer to peer learning happens. Um, and what was the other question? Uh, so well, that, well, that was the previous one, yeah. but, um, which is <laughs> yeah. really good. <laughs> no, um, and uh, so the girls. two questions. What, oh, girls. Look, look at the girls. horizon. What are you excited about testing and why, why girls? Well, I'm excited about Ready. Um, yeah. It's an incredible program, incredible, incredible. But, um, you know, I think gr we are doing uh, other studies looking at um, young women and girls. And while they're not the ones pulling the trigger or as often the ones being shot, the violence is having profound impact on them. The, unfortunately for girls, they tend to internalize more so than externalize. And so really understanding what kinds of interventions, they're going to look different um, for girls, but we think it's really, really important. And we also think that girls and young women are also very important just in general as often the ones who are raising <laughs> the boys. Um, we need to make sure that we're providing the support to the young women um, so that they can be healthy as well as they're caring for their, for their kids. Yeah, I'm going to, you threw those two questions together, but they actually, for me, are the same, the, what I'm excited about and the, and the women and girls question. So the thing about the Ready Chicago program, and we, we, we have to be very careful about, we're, we're being recorded and we, you know, we're not through with the study, and so we have to be careful about what we reveal. But we do lots of site visits. We take elected officials, we take funders um, to meet with the men who are in this program. We so far have engaged 500 men in the jobs program. Um, and these truly are individuals that have not participated in other programs. So lots of nonprofits think that they're serving a very high-risk group, um, and they don't know high risk until they saw this group. And um, this group has, um, they are extraordinary. They have incredible stories, and they talk about the richness of the CBT and what they're getting out of it, and it's always incredibly moving. It moves us to tears every time. It is just incredible. Um, and so it occurs to us that there really is a segment of the population that we have never reached, and we're reaching them now, and, and something like 60% uh, uh, of them have children. And so what happens to these men is going to have a profound impact on the children in their lives um, and the women in their lives. And so what's exciting for me um, coming up is um, taking a look at the women in the, in, the, in the social networks of the men who are engaged in the READY program. So we are, we are now engaging, um, uh, have relationships with over 1,000 of these very, very high-risk men. And that means all of the women in their lives um, we can be learning something about um, and I'm just incredibly excited about what we might learn that we can then develop um, interventions around and test. Um, so let me say two things. One, in terms of excitement and tying it back to the prior question about predictive analytics. So I think part of the reason predictive analytics have been controversial is because they have, in this sort of space, been used almost entirely to target law enforcement efforts, right? So it's about how are we going to curtail civil liberties or sort of police differently based on these predictive analytics? And what Reddy is doing is saying, how are we going to offer social services? Let's use these predictive analytics in the service of offering a job and social support. And so, this, I mean, it's a little bit weird that we haven't done this before, I think, but I think there is this sort of attitude um, uh, among service providers of like, we're going to help everyone and we think we know who everyone is and the more people, the better, right? Like, how do we counter impact? Number of people served. And what we're doing is saying, like, actually, let's try to target that. And I, I think it's going to end up being less controversial. And so I think we're getting less pushback about the predictive analytics because we're targeting something uh, positive. Um, and I guess the second thing I would say about being excited is, is that um, you're all here. So like we're not doing this in sort of isolation. There are lots of people all over the world interested in in learning and using what they're doing to, to learn, right? And to gain better evidence. And I think like Chicago is a super exciting place and there's lots of lessons to learn there. But 
we are also going to learn from all of the things that that you all are doing. And so the fact that everyone is sort of now interested in evidence, not now, I mean, this has been a long time coming, but like is interested in evidence and building this. And I think uh, there are models popping up all over about how it's possible uh, is really the way that we're going to sort of move knowledge forward. So good job, everybody. Okay. <laughs> and last, last question then. Uh, and there's so many questions that have been unanswered, so please uh, grab the panel afterwards. Um, the, the behavioral science purists here uh, are wanting to isolate the nudges um, so perhaps one nudge from each of you. Which was the killer nudge that you think had the biggest impact in all of what we've experienced this, uh, this afternoon? Yeah, I, I asked the organizers this. I was like, this isn't strictly exactly nudges. Um, I guess I, I would think about it in terms of the dual process decision making, right? So like the ingredient of CBT that we think is working is taking the automatic, the sort of automaticity, the automatic thinking, and, and slowing down that process and getting people to unpack how they're thinking, sort of catching whatever their trigger is, whether it's my face is flushed or I'm breathing fast or I'm clenching my fist, mm -hmm. catching that and slowing down in those moments. That's our sort of hi behavioral hypothesis, I think, about why these programs are working. Yeah, I, I think the same thing. I, it, that is a sort of through line with much of the programming that we're evaluating is this sort of CBT and really trying to double down on the automaticity um, hypothesis. And we are seeing really consistent impacts. So and it's I, I mean, it is relatively scalable, it, it just because so much of these are manualized. So not being a researcher, I, I often say, okay, well, CBT has to be delivered by someone. Um, if, I, I think you'd have a different outcome if you were doing CBT by computer. Um, there is a relationship that's established between the people delivering the CBT and, um, and creating a community of, of people who care about these individuals in a way that they have never felt before that I think... Um, means something. So for me, the relentless engagement and the relationship building is, uh, is an important part that they can't measure, so they won't agree. But um, uh, I think it's a really important part. Yeah, great stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and one example um, from a big city in the UK, a guy called John Denley just did his <laughs> PhD with a guy called Barak Ariel from Cambridge. And it does feel a bit like a nudge where they used uh, the predictive analytics to highlight uh, who organized crime groups were. And they looked at number one and number two. Who's the guy in charge and who's the sec second in command? And they targeted the second in command. And uh, mm. they weren't in trouble. They just knew that they were involved in crime. So you had the control group where nothing happened. You had the test group where all an officer did was go and knock on the door and say, we know what you're up to. Um, what can we do to help you? And if you don't stop, we're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. One visit, one time. Uh, and, we, and, and when they did the subsequent analytics, saw a significant reduction in reoffending from the 2IC, uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 30% just for one visit, uh, mm. and a significant increase in crime caused by the person who was number one, who wasn't part of the experiment at all. Um, but it, it, was just, it was just interesting how you can apply those. Well, thanks very much for coming uh, this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please stay and ask more questions uh, if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you.